Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Let's um, get going. We've got a lot, we've got a lot to cover. Um, okay, so we're going to start now session eight, which deals with community infrastructure. And there are a number of topics that we need to work through. Uh, one is a carry forward from yesterday. The first topic we're going to deal with is the swimming pool cin cinema um, and, and the cinema, and that relates to policy issues around the justification for demolition of the buildings and the prior provision of alternatives. And I'll say I'll do a little bit of scene setting on that in, in a moment. Um, then we will deal with uh, open spaces and we will include within that discussion the uh, deferred item from yesterday, which related to the provision of amenity space for residents within, within the scheme. Um, that probably also links with space for children and play, and it may well be that they, uh, those topics can uh, meld into, into one, which may save us a little bit of time. Uh, and then we will uh, have a short session on the uh, retail content of the scheme and any impacts on the town centre. So uh, let me go back to that first issue, which relates to the swimming pool and cinema. Uh, and of the... 200 and something uh, letters of representation that uh, have been made on the application, by far the majority of them uh, expressed concerns and objections regarding the loss of these uh, leisure facilities and concerns about their uh, reprovision. Um, I'll, I'll just sort of set the scene in terms of uh, there are two key policies I need to consider from the Bridging Island Plan. Uh, the first is policy GD5, which makes a general presumption against the demolition of buildings, all premised on uh, issues of sustainability. Um, so there is that presumption against demolition of buildings, but there's a series of criteria uh, or, or exceptions that uh, uh, ca can be made to uh, override that presumption. So that's the first policy I need to explore. Uh, the second policy is policy CI5, uh, and that is that relates quite specifically to this site because it says, the redevelopment of the public swimming pool and or cinema on the St Helia waterfront will be supported where the prior provision of alternatives in town can be assured, which may be secured through the use of a planning obligation agreement as required. Now, this um, is uh, an item where I think I would like to just switch the order because I'm aware that the planning authority have set out some concerns about the, the application with regard to uh, these policies. So I think it's probably best if uh, uh, if the applicant's team is comfortable with that. Are you happy to well, do that? Yeah, I'm entirely content. So we'll, we'll go to... Johnson and Mr Jones, uh, if, if whoever, whoever's going to lead off on it, to set out the planning authority's uh, concerns. Um, okay, so sh do you want to start with GD5, the demolition aspect, or just the... It's, it's entirely up to you. It's entirely up to you. Should we tackle GD5 first? Yeah, yeah as far as GD5 goes, um, as you mentioned, sir, there is a... Um, a strong thrust in the policy to look to a more sustainable form of development within the island when it comes to the island's existing stock of buildings. Um, and from the sustainability argument side of things, we'd rather see buildings put into, um, into use or reused with or without adaptation before, considering, before considerations given to um, demolition and replacement of buildings. Uh, so that's kind of the, the thrust of policy GD5 is a move towards sustainability. Uh, the outline application before is actually does um, put forward proposals for fairly significant demolitions of substantial buildings. Um, so GD5 does obviously kick in. Um, there are three clauses to GD5 that should be... Um, each or all of them should be um, satisfied before planning permission is granted. And there's debate on GD5 with the three clauses as to whether 
any one of those clauses has to be satisfied. Is that okay? Do they um, all have to be satisfied, or do the first two have to be satisfied and the three uh, and the third one satisfied? What, what does GD5 mean in terms of interpretation? Um, our interpretation from the policy standpoint is that the three clauses of GD5, the first two clauses are separated by a, a semicolon, yeah. the second and third clause are separated by an or. Um, so an argument's been made previously that the or clause means that the third clause can trump the first two clauses. Um, and the third clause relates to the uh, proposed development being uh, basically either more aesthetic or, or more practical than what we have at the moment. Um, we would argue that if we allowed that third clause to trump the first two clauses, then the whole um, thrust of GD5 is lost. Um, it would become quite a flimsy policy if that third clause can triumph over the first two. Uh, so from the interpretation side of things, from the Bridging Island Plan, we would argue that GD5 requires satisfaction with either, well, in all cases, clause one should be um, satisfied, and then either clause two or either clause three. Ideally, all three would be satisfied. Uh, so in terms of the outline application requiring the um, substantial development of um, redevelopment of buildings, we have to also accept that the Southwest St. Helier planning framework was basically, it was basically predicated on an idea that the area was to be redeveloped, that we weren't going to see the retention of these large shed-like structures. Uh, they've never really garnered any uh, public support for their aesthetic quality. Uh, the uses are a different matter. The uses are of great uh, value to the island, but aesthetically the uh, buildings aren't renowned for, for their quality. And so the Southwest St. Helier framework, in a way, kind of it gives a basis to how we look at the GD5 argument in that we're laying out not an outline permission with the Southwest planning framework, but we're giving a, almost a consensus governmental view that we appreciate the buildings will be redeveloped. And so I don't think GD5 in this instance should be used as a block to preventing the demolition and replacement of the existing buildings on site. <clears throat> Thank you, that's very helpful because I was going to ask you that very question because I've got the SPG in front of me and I'm looking at page 27 uh, where at paragraph A1.14 uh, it says, the buildings themselves are not of any aesthetic value and present a brutal visual barrier separating the town from the waterfront. In effect, the buildings have turned their back onto the town. Um, and then it goes on about the op opportunity sites. So when I read that in the SPG, is that ticking the box for GD5 generally or just GD5 item three? Yeah, certainly ticking the box for um, item three. Um, for item one, we would prefer to see um, some detail given as to the um, economic and environmental costings of um, refurbishing the buildings and bringing them into use. But having said that, um, that would be a, a perfect situation. But having said that, I think because of the grounding given in the uh, SPG, I think that in itself is basically uh, lining the way for GD5 to be satisfied uh, in this instance. In the sense that the SPG is seeing the waterfront development as a sustainable, a strategic scale sustainable development. It is, but the, I mean, there's a bit of time lapse here between the preparation of the South West St. Helier SPG and the Bridging Island Plan. The Bridging Island Plan actually ups the ante when it comes to the sustainability argument. Um, and so the, the, the SPG was produced at a time when we didn't have 
um, the kind of the knowledge about the carbon embodiment in buildings and the, the environmental costings of retaining and refurbishing a building or demolishing it and replacing. So we would prefer to see some additional detail just to close off um, the first element of GD5. Kind of a belt and braces approach, if you like, rather than just rely on the older Southwest St. Helier SPG. Okay. Can, can I just bring Mr. Nicholson in on, on that? Because um, you can appreciate what I'm doing. I'm trying to get to a clear position on, on the policy, and I think Mr. Coase is taking a fair way down that yep. GD5 path, but not quite pushed it over the, over the line. So do you want to try and push it over the line? Um, uh, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Coates, for your review, a great deal of which I, uh, I, I agree with. The um, position that I have taken across um, uh, s several policies in, in, my, in my assessment is um, reading across the strategic intent of the island plan uh, as um, supplemented where necessary by the South Western Helio framework, by the urban character appraisal and looking at what the application seeks to achieve as a whole. I have uh, taken a, a proportionate approach to uh, some policies, and I accept the uh, position um, in my statement that, that Mr. Coates has just talked about, uh, talks about that the Southwest St. Helier framework is, is written on the basis of predicating uh, demolition. I have identified the, uh, the same uh, text that you... Um, brought our attention to, sir. The, the element where uh, I would like to start is the, in the structure of the, the, the policy itself. Um, we do have a, um, a, a need to refer to this policy on a, on a regular basis uh, you know, in, in lots of applications uh, that, that touch uh, demolition. We have not had a huge amount of uh, appeals um, resulting in um, analysis of the policy framework. This is a, a plan which was adopted in March last year. Uh, there were um, there was a whole chunk of last year where there were no planning committees because we had a general election. There was a PERDA period. That was followed by a summer break. And so uh, we're only just getting um, determinations of appeals for applications that were, were heard um, under this iron plan. We've, we've had two in, in my understanding, that uh, deal with GD5 uh, and interpretation. Um, one was a property uh, bungalow, High View. These are two great names, High View, and the second was Sunny Brow. Uh, they both involved uh, demolition, and the uh, independent inspectors both gave an analysis of GD5 which puts um, a different uh, approach on the uh, wording than Mr. Coates has, uh, has outlined. They inserted or after each of the tests um, so that um, compliance requires, uh, compliance with the policies requ requires compliance with just one of the three tests. Um, that interpretation wasn't just uh, the position of the inspectors. It was also accepted by uh, the minister in one and the assistant minister in the other. So there's a fairly good pedigree in terms of um, the, the people who've reviewed this. Uh, and I actually did a bit of analysis going back to the, um, the way this policy was put together in the Bridging Island Plan itself. And I think that is a fair uh, <coughs> conclusion that the um, inspectors, assistant minister and minister um, identified. Uh, I think it is, um, you know, it's, it's common. The application does propose to clear the buildings. I, I think a case can be made against all the requirements, uh, you know, whether it is one and two plus three, whether it is all three or whether it is one or two or three. So I think it is accepted that the um, 
application has uh, high level uh, benefits in terms of sustainability identified through the strategic policy framework in relation to um, the spatial credentials of the sites, the evidence we heard um, uh, from the highways team, the transport planners earlier today was uh, very much uh, aligning with that view. It has a strategic importance in relation to housing needs and the evidence we heard um, from um, Mrs. Day yesterday uh, points clearly to that. So uh, the, 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 whether it is appropriate in sustainability terms to remove those buildings, I think can be uh, looked at through um, high, high level analysis of the, the term sustainability in the context of what the plan is trying to achieve in, in, its, in its strategy. If we look at then the, the points that uh, Mr Coates said about whether it is um, appropriate to repair or refurbish these buildings, my, my open question is, to what end? We, we, we have a, um, a swimming pool, which is uh, not the best building. Uh, we had the former manager of the pool come to the um, public event at the parish hall. Uh, we've also had a, a, a representation I've seen, uh, I think it was uploaded today, from the Wars Polo Club talking about uh, the... the the state of, of the building as a uh, competitive uh, swimming venue. Um, these buildings were not constructed to be converted. They are uh, bespoke um, kind of leisure boxes, if you like, in terms of uh, the, the cinema. Uh, the, there is no uh, inherent thermal performance. Uh, it, it is almost impossible to provide a, um, a kind of carbon assessment of before and against because we're not comparing uh, before and after because we're not comparing like with like. Um, it is my view that it is, it is appropriate in sustainability terms. There is a waste management plan that looks at the, the, the case for demolition and sets out the um, uh, uh, ability to recycle almost all this, or, or, almost all the, uh, the, the material. Uh, but you know, fundamentally, I think we should ask ourselves quite a direct question as to um, if we are seeking to refurbish and retain these buildings, then to what end is that? The, the opportunity cost is, uh, is significant. Um, the swimming pool has, in my personal experience and from the, the uh, input that we've had, it's never fulfilled its potential. Uh, it is not uh, what the island uh, looks to in terms of its uh, competitive swimming um, uh, you know, venue, it, it goes. They, they go to the legacy facility at uh, Le Kenneve. I The, the acoustics uh, and um, size of the pool are not uh, useful for um, competitive swimming. We also have uh, a, an underlying commercial question about the demand for a multiplex cinema of ten screens. Um, this is uh, uh, let to Cineworld and the uh, parent company are in uh, bankruptcy in the United States. There is the evolving uh, market of home entertainment after the uh, pandemic. And a 10 screen uh, multiplex cinema is um, not something which uh, is necessarily uh, desirable to uh, repair or, or, or refurbish and bring up to date. Uh, if, they, if those structures are retained, I think most fundamentally, the, Approximately 50% of the site potential is removed. That's, that's roughly 450 units. That is the same yield, give or take, than is achieved through all the rezoned greenfield sites in the, in the island plan. It's within 10, within 10 units, I think, of the, um, uh, of the target. So uh, that is the sustainability question, sir. Uh, is it sustainable that, that, that we don't maximise the opportunity, which the SPG and the island plan direct us to do, uh, and that we, um, we invest our time and energy in, in uh, buildings which are prejudicing wider um, objectives. Uh, so you know, the, the, the second point is, is 
is my is my uh, analysis of we, we we would lose 450 units from the from the yield if we kept this this building. So the second the second test is whether it is um, more sustainable, having regard to the density of existing and proposed development, overall carbon impact, waste generation, and the use of materials. I think in relation to all those points, the, the density would um, re result in a only 50% of the current potential being yielded. Performance of current materials is poor because of the nature of the uh, construction of the uh, existing buildings. In relation to carbon impact, I think we should direct ourselves to the overarching objectives of the spatial strategy uh, and the first priority of the um, uh, carbon roadmap being to reduce travel, uh, aligning very cleanly with the uh, objectives of the STP. Uh, I think the third point in GD5 is exactly the point that the SPG itself directs us to, is that these buildings have no aesthetic uh, value. Uh, there is a significant practical benefit in terms of replacing them. Uh, I think that a, a case is made against all three of these and that to require uh, some form of uh, um, financial analysis is really um, not uh, accepting the uh, points which are in plain sight. Okay, Mr. Nixon, anything you want to come back on? No, I'd just like to say, <coughs> excuse me, I, I agree with uh, much of what Mr. Nicholson said. Um, in terms of um, retaining the buildings to what end, um, I wouldn't like to say for one minute that the buildings have much of a life left or that they should have a life left. It's just I think we wanted the evidence to say what that likely lifespan is that they have left as a, uh, a safe, usable building. Um, and again, the, the aesthetics, the uh, better use of land, I think are all very much in favour of the proposals. Uh, it's just we would like to have seen a, a clear statement on GD5 just to tick off all those points. And maybe in all the documentation, all those points are ticked off, but uh, I haven't kind of unpicked that myself. Uh, but, yeah, I'd concur with much of what uh, Mr Nicholson says on that one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I've just been, it's just been pointed out to me that the sustainability uh, statements uh, and, and the submissions do discuss the... Um, the fact that the, the, the thermal performance of the, the current building fabric uh, is likely to result in uh, disproportionately high operational carbon emissions uh, compared to the minimal savings in uh, adapting those buildings for a, a long-term future. So there, there is a kind of carbon commentary in the sustainability statement too. But I think we have reached the same conclusion, probably through slightly different routes. Okay, thank you. Let, well, let's continue um, on uh, the theme of the cinema and the swimming pool, because I, I mentioned the number of representations I have, and I read out the uh, other relevant policy, policy CI5, and it, I won't read it out again, but uh, it, um, it requires prior provision of alternative facilities. Now, th maybe this is a point where I bring Ms Johnson in, because in her proof, uh, she sets out um, uh, some concerns, effectively saying that that doesn't seem to be guaranteed. Yeah, OK, thank you. So, um, as part of the application, we know that phase three of the scheme will see the demolition of the existing leisure facility um, and its replacement with an enhanced leisure facility. So, as you mentioned, policy CI5 requires the prior provision of alternative facilities in town to be assured. So, the first time we saw in writing how this transitionary arrangement might work um, was in the applicant's updated planning statement, which was provided after the deadline for proofs of evidence. So, some of these points now are in response to that. Um, and it basically explains their proposed strategy for this. And it says that in terms of the swimming pool, the strategy involves repurposing the proposed Lido as an enclosed facility for the temporary period between the closure of the aqua splash and the reopening of the new swimming pool facilities. So that clarification is welcome, thank you. 
I guess in response to that, my comments and questions would be um, the issue of the continuity of swimming pool facilities um, was, was, as you mentioned, the number one concern raised by representations from the public. Um, we, one of those representations was a submission from De La Salle College Secondary School who noted that they use the pool for their school swimming lessons, as do other local schools, and that other pools are too far away um, or ser are served um, by a number of other schools. The challenge is, as this information was put in writing after the deadline for proofs of evidence and hasn't really been part of a formal consultation process, as a planning authority, we don't know if this arrangement meets the needs of the community and the users. There were a variety of different user groups who put in representations, um, and I don't know if the community feels this arrangement would address their needs. We've had no responses that I've seen to date um, from any members of the community to say, thank you for this clarification. We note it, it's welcomed, it addresses our needs. Um, and the other thing I would mention is that the proposed Lido is 142 square meters. The existing swimming pool provision is three and a half thousand square meters. Now I acknowledge that the existing swimming pool provision is part of an existing leisure center. So there is ancillary floor space, and other uses there. But I guess we have to question the value those other uses come forward in terms of providing a complementary range of uses within a facility. Um, the Lido is significantly less in size than the existing swimming pool provision. So we really don't know if this is going to provide an adequate level of alternative provision within the three-year period when potentially, if the phasing goes to plan, the three-year period in which the existing facility gets demolished and the replacement gets constructed. As a further point, um, the concept of covering the Lido and making that a usable space, we don't have any details on that. Um, it's a sensitive location, there are heritage assets nearby, we don't know the visual impacts of that, how that would work. Um, so those would be our concerns really, and we'd welcome the applicants' feedback on that. Okay, Mr Nicholson. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, We've been aware of this um, element of the iron plan, and uh, as we know, there has been a very long um, period uh, of uh, this proposal emerging and uh, going through the consultation and reaching the uh, inquiry that we're all in today. Um, where we started off in terms of the wider uh, context is uh, not where we are today. Um, the swimming pool and the cinema uh, have both been considered in um, other government-led strategies. Uh, and we, where we started off, there was a project uh, within government called the Active Places Sports Strategy, which dealt with the reprovision of, of wet, I call it wet play, it sounds like a primary school activity, um, wet sports, uh, swimming. Uh, and that had a uh, kind of holistic uh, approach to consider um, the, the reprovision of, of swimming facilities. Similarly, uh, future of Fort Regent, uh, sports has been uh, moved out of Fort Regent. You probably may have seen the press this week with the uh, public gym uh, closing. And the emerging proposals for Fort Regent back in uh, 2019, 2020, uh, were to include uh, a uh, replacement cinema provision in Fort Regent. Through um, various decisions made in, in government, neither of those opportunities are uh, progressing anymore. So you know, we, we find ourselves uh, not quite jilted at the altar, but needing to deal with the implications of that. And uh, the applicant, the, the situation is still fluid. So the applicant is prepared to commit through um, whatever mechanism you may uh, think appropriate or uh, in conjunction with the planning authority, uh, we're prepared to commit to consistency of service, both those um, facilities um, through the delivery of the application. Now, uh, the situation is still uh, likely to change and you know, discussions are still going on in, in government. The opportunity 
is available as a, uh, as a fallback commitment to repurpose the Lido. That's an early phase in, in, the, in the delivery program. The uh, clearance of the swimming pool is a, is a later phase to repurpose the, repurpose the Lido as, as an enclosed facility. That is likely to need a separate full application. Um, so it, it, it would need to be, it's not within this application, it, it would need to be dealt with as a distinct item at that time. So that, that would be to put it into a temporary structure? Correct. Yep. Just for that, yep. however long that period was? Yep. The three. Uh, the research has already been done. They, these are uh, way beyond uh, some of the uh, facilities that I've used in terms of uh, you know, generations of swimming lessons ago. Um, and, and there is a... Uh, uh, you know, a, an, an availability of um, practical uh, and aesthetic options uh, to, to do that, accepting it would be for a, uh, a limited limited period. But um, in the absence of uh, government uh, moving their other strategies forward, the applicant has a, uh, a proposal. The second element is in relation to the cinema, uh, and this is perhaps more, more dramatic. Uh, if alternative provision is not secured uh, within town, as the policy requires, the applicant will commit to rephasing the application uh, so that replacement cinema provision is delivered ahead of the uh, closure and demolition of the current facility. So there'd be a, 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 a full stop in the timeline. Um, we believe that both those commitments can be secured through a planning obligation agreement. Just explain that to me again. The, the what you, you call the rephasing? What explain that? Um, the uh, cinema, uh, current cinema is within um, phase one, three redevelopment, redevelopment of the existing cinemas in phase three. Phase three. Um, there is. Um, if the need arose, um, we would need to assess, um, and, the, and there's a detailed study to be carried out on exactly what the future uh, needs are and what the island can sustain in terms of cinema provision. Um, as M Mr Nicholson highlighted, it certainly isn't a 10-screen multiplex. Um, and anecdotally, um, we had an operation um, in... Uh, the northern part of St Helier that was four screens um, in the in the past, and allegedly one of the reasons that operator didn't um, come forward um, uh, for this uh, particular multiplex was that they just didn't ever think that there was going to be a demand for ten screens. So we are going to be back to uh, a provision of, of four or five screens um, in the future. The current um, multiplex is currently operating at a twenty three percent. Um, and, and, and that is not a, a viable um, uh, long-term provision. Um, so we're going to be assessing the, the market um, and if necessary, we'll need to um, design in that provision um, into phase one uh, to enable the uh, redevelopment um, of, of the existing multiplex in phase three. Hey. Just in response to that, um, I guess I would just make the point that I don't think it's as simple as rephasing the development. So the land uses that are applied for as part of this application, uh, which are articulated in the environmental impact assessment, um, include uh, use class I, which is the use class for cinema provision. Within that use class, it would include three uses, theatre, cinema and concert hall. The application as submitted only includes 495 square meters of that use class, and that is for the art house cinema, which as proposed would comprise three screens and 225 seats. So whilst it's a, it's an, it's a good idea, um, not challenging the idea, I think the practicality of it is unachievable um, based on the construct of the application. Um, the point I would make. Uh, I think that's I think that's fair. The um, the intention uh, the, the process would in, would involve uh, applying 
for the necessary variations. Just like the swimming pool, um, applying for the structure, it, there would need to be a, uh, a, a regulatory process and the relevant applications will be made. So I guess in response to that, I would say that I don't think that provides the comfort that there is an assurance that that can be guaranteed because you won't have a permission in hand um, for that use. And it will require quite a significant change to the, screen, uh, to the scheme, um, probably updates to your environmental impact assessment. Um, and there will be other uses which get changed. So I, I just don't think that at this stage that provides the comfort required by policy CI5. I don't know if you want to add to that, Alistair. Yeah, I'll just <clears throat> add very briefly that, that the policy requires an assurance um, that alternative facilities will be uh, provided. An assurance to me is basically a, a, a promise that has got a very real and true prospect of being delivered. And that would entail really sites uh, being identified at this stage in the process, sites that have got um, government backing or got some form of planning permission for use as a um, cinema or swimming pool. Um, and as uh, Ms. Johnson said, I don't think what we've heard is actually an assurance that these facilities will be uh, delivered elsewhere. We've got a fa fairly good kind of promise that they'll do everything to provide these facilities, but that isn't an assurance that the facilities will be replaced. And it's a difficult situation for you, sir, to, to look at an outline application with these requirements when we don't have these other facilities identified as um, clear and viable options for um, replacement facilities. We might just delve into the actual requirements of, uh, of the policy. It, the, the policy um, asks, I'll, I'll just get the uh, actual wording. The policy asks that, that demolition, the loss of the facilities, doesn't occur until um, re replacements are secured. So it, it, it's part of the acceptance that these are uh, going to remain available to the, to the community. So um, you know, the redevelopment, it's about losing them before providing alternative facilities. We can provide that assurance that the facilities w will not be lost uh, until a, uh, an alternative is found. It, it doesn't require an alternative to be found and then a consideration of if the facilities can be lost. The, 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 uh, the, the two are, are, are linked together and the, the problem lies with us from the from the position of the regulatory authority there is there, there is a you know a, a backstop that the facility will not be lost the the, the task of then uh finding the alternative is is on our side of, of the, the the problem and so the, the the breach of the the potential breach of the policy does not occur because the because the facility yeah. stays it is a tricky one, isn't it? Uh, I, I can see. Um, if you take the cinema, uh, I mean, even assuming that the minister grants planning permission, how, how long is it going to trade for? Uh, it, it's we, not a... we, Cine World are currently in Chapter 11 yep. in the US. Where are that? Yeah. And um, we are currently in negotiations with Cine World to remain in operation um, in the island. Um, those negotiations are ongoing. Um, I think the fact that this cinema is trading at such a low level of occupancy um, indicates that the, the, the difficulty um, of, of, the, uh, of, of the task in hand. Um, we are committed to maintaining a cinema on the island. We understand the importance it has to islanders and, and we are very much here for the community um, and we will be um, uh, ensuring that that, that provision um, is maintained whether it's 10 screens in the future or, or, or it, as I've said earlier it's going to be less um, but we're committed to 
ensuring that the island still has a cinema. Okay. What, what I'm hearing then from the applicant side is that you will, in one way or another, comply with policy CI5 yes, and sir. that you are prepared to enter planning obligation yes, sir. terms to secure that. Yep. What I'm hearing over here is that's all well and good, but you want some more certainty. And then I'm hearing over here well, we can't give you that certainty because there are so many unknowns. Mr Nicholson talked about Fort Regent and, yep. uh, and other sites. Uh, Mr Henry uh, has, has mentioned about the cinema op operator uh, and what is the demand for cinema in the, in the future. Uh, I take it there isn't a piece of work that's been undertaken on, on that, but you, you speculate it's for, it's certainly not for a 10 screen, it's for something less. Whether it's down to the level of uh, the art house cinema and the floor space is is a is another another matter. But sorry, so if I can just come in on that point, it will be greater than than that facility right. that, that's required. That was in addition to the island's primary cinema. That was yes. an ancillary um, facility. Okay. It, 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 but I, I'm sorry, just to um, add to what Mr. Nicholson referenced, that it, it it is our problem to resolve. Um, and we're happy to take that on um, insofar as if the cinema provision is not relocated at Fort Regent, and we will know that within a, a fairly short period of time. The problem will, comes back to we you. We will need yep. to provide for that within phase one via, via a revised application um, in order for us to unlock our phase three. Otherwise, the cinema will need to remain in, in, in its current okay. location. That, that is the, the, the need for separate planning applications is very relevant, whether, whether it's through opportunities that may exist for doing things differently on this site or through securing uh, the facilities elsewhere. But whatever happens, the new, a, a, a swimming facility, repurposing the Lido, putting it somewhere else, it's all going to need to be applied for as part of the process. I think, as I've said from, from the opening, we need to view this issue uh, through a proportionate lens in the context of everything else that's going on. Uh, if, if we were, were in a, um, a perfect world, then Fort Regent would be resolved. Uh, the the uh, Inspiring Active Places uh, strategy would be resolved, and we, we'd have a you know, clear sequence uh, to say tick, 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 for reasons which are you know, uh, beyond the control of the, of the applicant. Um, those two um, projects are, are not concluded, and it would be a, a massive problem in terms of the other things that are delivered uh, in, in, in relation to this application if Southwest and Hellier went, went the same way. It, wrapping everything up together is, in, in my view, a, uh, a recipe that, that is just not palatable to the island. Um, and there are appropriate controls to make sure these things happen and can we move forward uh, together rather than in a lengthy time sequence. Okay. Anything further? I, you've both got clear positions. We, we may well pick it up again in the planning obligations section, but uh, I would probably draw a line there. We've sp actually spent much longer on that than I, I thought we were going to. Um, Mr McCarthy. I'm about 15 minutes behind schedule already. I, so. I wish I didn't have to say anything, to be quite honest. Um, but I have to, unfortunately. Um, you don't. <laughs> you don't want me to. If it's, if it's relevant, it's, yeah, Mr. It McCarthy, relevant. you're course, very, very welcome. I mean, I've just listened to some learned gentlemen, but it's... Um, sorry. The... The importance of this is that, I have to say it again, the islanders own the land. The islanders own the swimming pool. It's their swimming pool, and yet they own the, the cinema. And what we have is a caretaker looking after it, or not looking after it. Um, it is the responsibility of the JDC under their uh, memorandum with the government. is about regeneration, contribution to the islanders and islanders. Uh, to I the island and islanders. 
and I hopefully our tourists. Um, and one of the, there are a number of things floating around here, but regeneration does mean destroying what little public facility we have when it rains, which is most of the time, and especially on this site, uh, which is blown by the wind. The, the, I mean, it's not new, is it? Uh, you must have come here all the time. You've got a developer who owns a low-rise building, especially if it's a public facility, and they'll use any old excuse so they can demolish it and build a seven-storey block of flats. Yeah, it's nothing new. So we shouldn't... However, this is an employment zone. And as far as I understand, and I don't know if it's the same in Jersey, but you have to advertise it and prove that you haven't got another user for it. And you have to prove over two years that is there an operator which will operate the swimming pool? That isn't a policy requirement, Mr. In, 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 in Jersey? It's not in respect of this development. Okay, though. okay. The, and there's very good reason why that is in, in place. But we also got to look at the users. Who are these users? It was meant uh, the sports, uh, the swimming is for, you know, for, for, for people doing racing. Uh, but there are plenty of other users, um, and one of the ones are children. There's older people, um, and a lot of those obviously enjoy privacy, um, and there's tourists, but it's got to be a fun place. And I totally disagree, uh, and I've worked with some of the best architects in the world. That swimming pool building is fabulous. It's just a shame it hasn't been looked after. It is exciting. You know, it's thrilling. And you hear kids screaming in there, having, you know, going down the slides and things. So I... I just, don't under, I, I just don't understand how they can say that. The, the other aspect is the, if we just look at why do they put a swimming pool in that location originally? Why do they put a cinema in that location? You know, and the objective of master planning is not to generate a problem to solve. And everything I'm hearing from the other side, we're going to solve it, we'll solve it. No, there should be nothing to solve. It should be how can we celebrate this amazing proposal and make it even better. But it's problem, problem, problem. Now, we all accept that the Liberation Road and the Roundabout and the Harbour Road that surround this site is noisy 24-7, is air polluted 24-7. And... That's why you put a swimming pool there. Because a swimming pool has to be air conditioned. It has to be. So the windows are closed, so you can't hear the outside. You're not, you could treat the air so you're not polluted. So it's a very good place to put a swimming pool. And no better place, because it's not overshadowed. The other aspect um, we move now into um, the aspects of, uh, of the theatre, of the cinema, and the, and I said the gym. Similarly, obviously, uh, a cinema, you close the window, you don't have any windows, it's a solid box. And within it, you have air conditioning, because that's the nature. You know, suddenly you've got a lot of people turn up, and you put on the power, and you switch it off. So it's a very good place to locate. However, the other aspect is things like uh, energy, and you're absolutely right, and what swimming pool needs is direct sunlight going through a window and heating the floor that you're sitting on, or an elderly person having a bit of sunbathing. But what's amazing about swimming pools and cinemas, they're social condensers. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are, you all sit, jump in the water together. It is a unique where the whole island come together regardless of income. But also, we've got a park. I, mean, I have to include the fact as these are low-rise buildings, and we have a very important park. Now, that park, and I now have to call up the section. No, Mr McCarthy, oh. I'm, I'm going to stop well, you here. There, there are two policies I'm exploring, and... The sustainability, and... 
No, well, the, the policies I highlighted were policies GD5 and CI5. And I do listen with interest to what you have to say, but I do notice that you never actually mention bridging island plan policies. And yep. they are, yep. <laughs> that's why I'm here. Uh, I'm yep. assessing the but, proposal against them. Yes, OK. So if we just move on to demolition of body buildings and demolition of buildings and yep. the embodied energy, a concrete swimming pool is a lot of embodied energy and so by demolition it's the, it's the loss of that embodied energy that we could retain and we don't want to build, demolish it and rebuild it and the other, the other aspect about um, reuse of buildings is we don't want to build another building somewhere else that requires a lot more energy to operate so I think there's two things on the keeping these existing buildings in this particular location. Number one is the embodied energy. I totally disagree with the thing that, that it, it's a 20-year-old building. Of course, it should be reskinned. That's a responsibility, and we should be increasing installation value. So I don't, don't buy that one. The second thing is its operational costs and its uh, amount of energy it will use. And a swimming pool needs sunlight. And the proposed relocation of the existing pool, as I've repeated, is not, is so substandard comparison, it is, well, it, it's not worth considering because it doesn't see the sunlight and it won't be used. And one of, uh, linking back to that is a sustainability and reusing things is getting children to swim and learn to swim and it's all about the atmosphere. And that particular pool in, it, in its location is ideal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Uh, I don't think we've got anything to add beyond what's in the application submission, sir. OK, thank you. Uh, right. Uh, can you be quick? I'll be quick. And I mean quick. We're a long way behind the schedule now. I apologise for that. <clears throat> I'll be quick. I'm not your fault, not your fault. Probably the last surviving member of the web team that put the successful part of this waterfront together. Uh, the swimming pool, as um, Chris has just said, very good architects, won a competition. It's been there 20 years. It'll do another 50. Um, La Fregatte, okay, is now listed, can't be demolished, and by the way, can't be moved. The site is part of the listing process. <clears throat> you, you, you have made those points to me, Mr Mason. I have, okay. I have made a note. Excuse me. Excuse me. 17 listed buildings in the last 10 years in Jersey have been demolished. I live in Berkshire Court. I walk to Sandanda Cafe, should take 10 minutes, takes me half an hour. Sudge DC have a nickname, it's the States of Jersey Demolition Company. You know why they pull the limes down? Is that, is that, is that their responsibility? No. There's a, there's a worldwide, even Norman Foster I spoke to last year, would you come to, back to Jersey, Norman? He said, yeah, for Fort <coughs> Regent. But Norman Foster is now talking about refurbishing existing buildings. It's very, very important. That's all I've got to say. OK, thank you. Right. Mr Young. In my letter of representation, sir, um, um, I asked this question as a member of the public, um, being a former chairman of the Jersey Arts Centre, and obviously it's relating to policy CI5. And uh, policy, uh, the policy uh, CA5 makes the, uh, is obviously the policy that provides for uh, new or extended uh, cultural facilities um, and include one of the site, uh, the key opportunity sites in the southwest St. Helia planning framework area. And of course, that actually is referred to in the preamble. Uh, obviously, when I look at the block plan over there, sir, I see that uh, obviously the site, all of the site areas have all been marked with 
um, block numbers. Uh, and in particular, I know uh, the, the site that I've always thought the Jersey Art Centre would become, uh, could have the possibility or should have the possibility in the future of joining in with a uh, overall um, island-based uh, cultural facility, which would include all the elements, the art centre, which operates in the north part of town at the moment, where the facilities are very restricted, uh, very limited, limited, restricted, but they do very, very well, uh, and also the opportunity for an art gallery and so on. Could I ask, I see um, policy, I think, uh, I mean, plot, plot number G1, I think, is always, could I ask, well, first of all, what, what, what blocks have been allocated for uh, potentially a cultural site, or are all the blocks uh, full of housing um, or, or commercial uses? Uh, and secondly, has there been any dialogue with, uh, as part of the arts community, the Jersey Arts Centre, about what might be done in the long future? Because obviously this is not a short-term thing, but this, we're here planning the longer-term future for that to be within an, a cultural site. So I apologise if I missed that earlier. No, sir. I, think, I think we but have, I would like we have that covered to, it. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I think that. you've interpreted it uh, co correctly, uh, sir. The G1 is, is identified on the uh, schedule. Um, the, uh, uh, sorry, it, it's uh, uh, set out on, on the uh, land use um, template, the, the, the framework. And um, there's been uh, various discussion w with the um, arts communities as part of the um, overall engagement as set up in the uh, material. Uh, there is ongoing discussion in relation to um, potential occupiers and uses that, that may emerge to uh, animate uh, that space. And uh, it, it's very much a live issue. You are quite right in your understanding of where that is currently envisaged. Well, well, thank you, sir. I mean, obviously, that is a downstream project because <laughs> shaping up a community arts facility is not an easy matter because we've got a range of different organisations, all of which contribute uh, to part of the of the offering. Yep. But I think, given that site G1, sir, it's always been seen as what used to be talked about in previous planning visitors as a landmark site, an opportunity for something special to a building to mark the entrance that people would see as they come into St. Helier. Um, and that's a big, I think that, that, I find that an exciting prospect, sir. Well, uh, it is all part of delivering a, um, uh, an interesting place to live with vitality uh, at, uh, across, the, uh, across the scheme. And there are numerous opportunities identified for arts, cultural, community uh, spaces. In that. Well, 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 thank you, though. It is, obviously, it's not just local, but I believe, sir, that there is a strong economic case in terms of uh, visitors to the island. And, uh, and so I think it is a pretty important matter. Obviously, there's a downstream issue about who pays for it and who's going to do it. But I take it, since it's in the application, that means that the SOJDC, if you like, are providing the, the framework uh, for the, uh, uh, an application were it to become uh, possible to be, have that application downstream um, and to be funded. Uh, I can't offer commitments on funding, but I, I'm pleased we've reached a position where we understand that this application is a framework within which future uses and activities can fit. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. I think that's thank to you. clarify thank that. You. Okay. Right. Uh, I just want to pause for, for a moment there. We've spent a, a long time on that first item, which I thought was going to be uh, a lot quicker. We've got uh, next items around various amenity space, open spaces, space for children and play. And then we've got um, one on retail <coughs> content and impact. We've then got the last session of the daytime uh, sitting uh, on drainage and flood risk. And I've been passed a note saying we've got a witness availability issue. I believe, Mr. Nicholson, your witness has to be away by 4.30. Correct. I'm just conscious that that was also the time that you indicated you would hope to have finished today. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Um, now, well, let me take some soundings from you here, accepting that there, there may be a few questions along the way. Um, the... Retail content, 
content and impact. I ha I'm pretty well prepped on that. I did, although it arrived fairly late, I did. I have read the retail impact statement that uh, uh, that, that came through, uh, and I don't need a great deal of time on that. I've got a, a few questions, but I don't think it would be uh, very long. Um, rounding up those uh, open space, um, amenity space, children's play issues. Could you give a feel for how long do you think we need on that? Um, we've made the uh, position uh, clear in, in the planning statement. It's uh, set out in the codes. Uh, it depends on, uh, I think, the uh, nature of questions that you may have. So. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we could uh, knock that off in five minutes, probably. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we don't mess about that's a, here. That's a bold prediction. <laughs> a very bold <laughs> prediction. Okay, well, on on that uh, understanding, um, I think we'll crack on with uh, session eight. But I think if we still happen to be uh, going on session eight and we're starting to drift towards quarter to four, I might just have to call a pause on it there and make, and, and uh, do the drainage. Uh, matters because I don't want to lose anything. I d certainly don't want the witness. We have a, a statement of common ground yes. as well, which I hope should focus. So on I'm hoping that that statement will mean that it's, it's quite a short session. Yeah. Okay. Well, let, let's move on to uh, this issue of the uh, green and amenity spaces with, within the scheme. Uh, and w there are some sub issues there. We, we deferred from yesterday. Uh, amenity space provision, uh, which is the more going to be the more private areas within the uh, the residential schemes, uh, and I think there are some standards that we need to uh, to, to reference there. Uh, we've also got the provision of the open spaces, uh, obviously two of which are uh, already existing and uh, would would be changed and and enlarged, and then questions around space for children and play. So there's quite a lot to pick up uh, there. And uh, uh, is it going to be you, Mr Con, lead off on this? Uh, I think, John, will you, I think, will you um, start with the amenity? Yes, I think, um, in my understanding, sir, we're looking at... Um, is there a plan I should have on my screen? I think the most relevant plan might be the... Uh, Landscape master. Uh, there's, there's one of the parameter plans, the ground floor, public realm and amenity space, 0020. Yeah, got that one. Maybe the most useful reference. That's a sort of colour-coded... Uh... Yes, oh, that's a good plan, yes. Um... So, uh, unless I'm mistaken, the... Um... Relevant policy is um, CI6, provision and enhancement of open space. Uh, we believe the application does both. It provides new and enhances uh, existing. Uh, it has uh, quantitative uh, en enhancements through a new public green space, public squares, landscape promenades, uh, and it has enhancements to the uh, qualitative provision within uh, Marina Gardens and uh, Jardin de la Mer, uh, focusing in particular on uh, active play, children's activities. At the top of page 30 on my um, planning statement, it, I have um, a short pricey of the uh, existing and proposed um, quantums. Public green space is, is roughly doubled. Uh, there is uh, about 56% um, of, of the overall quantum is, is existing space. Uh, there is a slight change to those figures, sir, if you've got your pen out on, on that. Um, the private communal uh, green space uh, has reduced to uh, the last bullet point should now read 1, 2, 5, 4, 5. Uh, and that is as a result of um, the removal of uh, a roof terrace um, in, uh, identified in the errata schedule to avoid anything coming out above uh, four, mm -hmm. eight. So uh, alongside uh, that, um, uh, those identified quantums, which are uh, secured 
through a combination of the parameter plans and the codes. I think it is um, acknowledged that uh, private residential balconies will also be provided. They will be detailed at the um, reserve matters stage. Uh, our um, focus has been on the uh, new guidance recently uh, issued on, uh, uh, from, from the Minister, uh, still in draft in relation to um, residential um, standards. That includes uh, spaces for uh, private balconies on a, on a graduating scale. I think it's from five square metres for the smallest apartments uh, going up. And uh, that is likely to be relevant to the assessment of reserve matters applications. And uh, the proposals in detail will comply with those. The same standards have uh, some commentary in relation to shared amenity spaces for flats. Uh, and having uh, set out uh, a, a broad calculation, the, the standard appears to uh, re require um, a shared amenity space up to a maximum level of 25% of the site area uh, on the basis of a, a gross site area of 11.8 hectares. Again, a small correction uh, in, from my, in my planning statements. Uh, we are comfortably in excess of the 25% uh, yardstick through the combination of um, new public green spaces, private communal green space, and the public squares uh, and plazas, which are available for, for everyone. Uh, we, we comfortably exceed that 25%. Um, so that 25% figure, where, where do I find that? That is in the draft SPG... Uh, I don't have the title immediately to mind. It's, uh, the Residential Space Standards. It is, yeah. Four. Page 14. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's helpful. Um, th there is further uh, open space, um, which uh, we haven't included in those in those calculations on, on the basis that they are um, either existing or, or they are elements which might be considered as um, kind of infrastructure and, and roadways, but they form part of the, the, the ground plane. They are landscapes and part of the environment, but we don't rely on those, and we think uh, we are very comfortably um, aligning on the basis of the, the spaces which are, are proposed with the um, specifics and the intention of those um, policies tied back into CI6. So. Okay. Um, yeah, um, I don't uh, dispute anything uh, Mr Nicholson says there, sir. Um, it's quite factual in terms of the submission. In terms of policy, again, the only quantitative... Um, guidance we have is the draft SPG on residential space standards and that quantifies what we would expect from private amenity space and shared amenity space for residents um, and so long as the um, development complied with those standards we'd be quite content with that. In terms of your wider concept of public open space and play space the, neither the Bridging Island Plan nor the any SPGs give quantitative um, guidance on what we would expect in terms of extent of public open space provision. Uh, we would just expect it to be uh, an appropriate amount of space for a development of this huge nature. And in saying that, we also bear in mind that the Southwest Planning Framework was predicated on a, a people and places concept first with buildings coming after and by that we mean any layout should clearly show a an evolving concept where we move from nice inclusive pleasant safe spaces linked by equally inclusive and pleasant linkages um, the plan should be predicated on a layout showing these spaces and linkages with the buildings then forming around those places and uh, 
linkages. We, we don't want spaces just created just because there doesn't happen to be a building here. Uh, the places and linkages should come first. But again, we, we don't have any uh, quantifiable means of saying we need this much provision. All I would say is we would refer to the St Helier Public Realm and Movement Strategy, which does identify various opportunities we have in the area for creating and enhancing spaces and public realm. Uh, for example, the um, Public Realm and Movement Strategy states that um, we could extend the public realm from the Jardin de la Mer through to the town centre um, by creating green linkages and a continuation of features, so we're kind of melding the seafront with town. It also goes on to say that we should um, create spaces for people, bringing the activity and vibrancy of the town centre all the way through to the waterfront. So it's all about using linkages and spaces to try and knit the the original the old town together with the new waterfront so we are we are at once trying to create a new quarter of the town but a quarter of the town that's inextricably linked and pleasantly linked with town itself so we get a through flow of people a through flow of activities and a through flow of feeling that you're in this special special environment and it makes the waterfront a, a very pleasant and um, desirable place to visit. But in terms of quantifiable things for public open space, we, we can't give any figures on what we'd expect, but what we would expect is that the applicants, SOJDC, who are one of our prime public realm providers within St Helier, we would expect them to do a first-rate job on public realm and public open space provision within the area. Okay, so in summary then, with policy CI6, uh, no objection? No objections, no, no. It's just a case of looking at the detailed plans and seeing if we're happy with those. But let me carry on with um, the, the policies in, in the plan that, um, that are close to that. So I go to CI7, which is protected open space. And I think I read in the Statement of Common yep. Ground that... Uh, uh, applicants and the planning authority agrees that this box is ticked um i i wanted to ask you a question though around um because on the the island plan proposals map they very clearly mark the uh, the protected open spaces uh, and if i look at le, le jardin de la mer um i just want to ask the question around the lido and the buildings that would appear there whether um, there is any tension with the purpose of policy C, well, or with the wording of policy C, R7, because it protects it as open space. Now, clearly, when you introduce a Lido into that open space, it's, well, I suppose the water is still open, but you can't walk across it. Um, and the, you, you've also introduced some building structures around the periphery. Um, it's something I'm going to have to um, address in, in my report when I, when I get to that policy. Welcome contributions from you. Uh, I, I think the uh, supporting text and the wording of the paragraph, uh, wording, of the, wording of the policy itself, uh, discusses the... Um, need to uh, look at the, 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 the qualitative uh, issues around um, community benefits uh, for the open space. Um, I think it should also be read in, in the context of um, the, 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 the quantums of open space that are uh, new open space that are delivered as part of, as part of the application. So this isn't um, a... You know, pinching part of a site, a, a part of protected open space for a development plot. It is about enhancing the community benefit as part of a, a wider um, approach to what those spaces are intended to do for the community. And um, the extended Le Jardin uh, has part, uh, has uh, a clear network of um, active elements to it with uh, the Lido, children's play, the proposed ball courts, and it has balanced with that uh, a spaces for more 
passive, open uh, recreation. And so it, it, is, it is part of a, a broader strategy towards open space and its, uh, its nature uh, across a, a, a range of uh, user demands. These spaces do already have structures in them in, 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 some, occasion, in some occasions. The area of, of uh, protected open space at um, Le Jardin uh, has the um, Le Frigat structure in it at, at the moment. So I don't see there is a, an in-principle uh, issue with having a building in there. It's about what that building does in terms of the, uh, the quality of the um, provision that is then offered. Okay. Planning Authority, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think all we say is that uh, uh, the Lido in an area of public open space, it could well work. Uh, the concept um, isn't necessarily uncomplimentary to public open, uh, protected open space. Um, if it's done well, it can be a good facility that actually complements the use of the protected open space. If done badly, be pretty grim um, but I guess it all comes down to the detail as to exactly how it would work how uh, the maintenance and management and access to the facility would work whether it is genuinely uh, part and parcel of a, a wider protected open space or whether it becomes an exclusive uh, health spa edition or something which, which wouldn't be inclusive and we wouldn't support uh, so it all comes down to the detail I think um we just look at that drawing that um, uh, Mr. Conn directed us to earlier, the 0020 drawing. Um, yeah. The, the, the Lido is a, an incidental part of, of that. Uh, and in terms of the, um, the uh, I might say, the future protected open space, if we look at a, a, an island plan in, in um, you know, 2030, uh, we, we can see the application makes provision for significantly more and better space um, if that Lido is uh, considered anomalous. Um, we can also point you to the uh, public consultation exercise and the Lido has come back as um, well, quite universally but, but there is a very clear um, uh, uh, agreement and a desire to uh, you know, get such a facility um, into, the, into the project. And it has some great synergies with the activation of that space um, on the on the foreshore. Okay, thanks. Um, and the next policy in the plan CI8 space for children and play. Um, you finished no, I haven't. No, I'm still going. <laughs> so you'll, I'll come to you in a moment. So. Yeah, CI8, Mr. I'd be happy to pick up on the, on the play provision. Um, so there's a there's a number of of play spaces that are committed to within the codes. Um, I think that uh, if I can direct you to bear with me. Um, so these these tend to be picked up within the uh, within the codes for each individual landscape space. Point and, me to a good example. Uh, so, for example, if we go to page thirty five, is probably a good one to start with. So, page thirty five within the summary codes. Um, so this is dealing with the Jardin de la Mer, um, and if you look at the the I think it's code uh, four point five point one six five. Um, which is uh, the play hub, a uh, minimum of 2,000 metres squared, uh, including planting. Um, that's in addition to retention of a, a large lawn area, which will obviously have a function as play space as well, which is also included in the codes further up, uh, 3,000 metres squared minimum. Um, I think in addition, there's uh, play spaces coded for um, Marina Gardens Play Hub, minimum of 1,000 metres squared. That's on page 39 of the codes. Uh, alongside, again, retention of some lawn space. Um, and there's also some codes that discuss provision of um, uh, sports, outdoor sports rooms within the West Park Gateway on page 32, uh, waterfront square water play, 
um, and provision of play within communal gardens and podiums for doorstep play for younger children. I think that we, a point that was made by the planning authority and, and um, we acknowledge there's perhaps a lack of clarity of exactly all of those spaces and, and the total amount that's being committed to. And I think we'd be very happy uh, to discuss that in relation to a planning condition and a commitment to, to a, an overall provision of play. Um, there's also some elements of the code to deal with the quality of that space. So uh, if I can just find the relevant page, um, page 107 of the summary codes uh, gives um, an overview of, of play strategy and describes a bit more about the quality and distribution of those play spaces. And there's also a significant amount of information in the DAS to, to, um, to explain the uh, design intent behind, the, behind those play spaces. Um, but I think it's, again, it's, it's perhaps something that we can discuss further in the session on Friday in terms of uh, uh, commitments and planning conditions. Okay, thank you. Just before I go to the public, could, um, if I turn to the planning authority in terms of those policies, and I was looking back at um, your proof, Ms Johnston, um, you did give um, I think section 10 of your proof that uh, deals with play space. Are, are there any concerns that you haven't heard addressed that you'd like to draw to my attention? Um, no, I think actually what was very helpful was in response to that, the applicant provided in their, their errata schedule some further breakdown and clarification in terms of age ranges for some of the uses, which uh, Mr. Conn mentioned we could secure by planning condition. I think that's a so you way forward. Yeah, we're you're, comfortable. You're content Thank you. on, on that. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. Um, let's see who's got any questions. So this is on open spaces and amenity areas. Um, any? Just Mr. Viber. Thank you, sir. Uh, the phrase open spaces is a pretty seductive term. And it seems to me that it's being used here to try and convince you that, in fact, there is a lot of open space within this whole area. In fact, it would appear to me that it includes the roads, rooftop gardens, courtyards, grassy strips with trees in them. But in fact, the public space we're talking about, open space, is where the public can enjoy a feeling as if they're in the open air and they're in the countryside. It's green space. And it appears to me that this pro program is lacking that in great numbers. We have a, a state's philosophy that's been approved by the states that we put children first. That's a publicly announced agreement on which all policies run by the states now have to abide by. And they're quite rigorous about making sure that that's followed. In fact, it appears to me that what's happening on the waterfront is we're putting buildings first. Now, I appreciate the fact that we've called in some very good people to do the landscaping. And it does look very nice on the pictures with lots of mature trees and it looks very green. But in fact, the two spaces that are allowed that look quite large, when I look at the model, unless the model is wholly inaccurate, the idea that 56% of the waterfront is green space cannot be justified. And on that basis, it appears to me that this plan is failing the people of Jersey. A simple matter of allowing or not putting any access to the beach. It's inconceivable that you design a waterfront project where you could go directly onto a beach, but you can't get there. How people are going to allow their children to get on the beach is a complete mystery to me. Now, I know, sir, you're facing a situation 
where at the moment there isn't a quantitative instruction in any of the island plans about how this whole area should be divided up. In you can't look at it and say, well, there should be X amount of green space. So it's really being left to you, you unfortunately, who have to make a decision about does it, does it comply with the island plan and all the, that is laid down? And if it's not there, you really have to rely on your own feelings and common sense about this whole project. And the question I'd put to you, sir, to be answered, would you, if you were living on that waterfront, would you be happy to bring your children up in that environment? And I think that should be the yardstick that should be used. Okay. Right. Okay, any, well, do, let me just check in. Any more on open spaces and um, amenity areas? Are we done on that? Good. Okay, the next item for discussion then is retail content and impact on St Helier Town Centre. Um, let me just find my, my notes. Well, I, I think I'm probably going to ask Mr Nicholson to run through this because uh, I think it is fair to say that the retail statement arrived a little late in the day. Um, I think it is a, it is a requirement uh, over a certain threshold of retail floor space that uh, uh, a statement is provided. Um, I received it on the 9th of this month. Uh, it's a assessment produced by, by Nexus. So, Mr Nixon, do you want to just uh, talk us through the issue and that report in summary form? Uh, yes, I, I think I'm uh, happy to acknowledge uh, exactly the context that you've set out. Uh, a little bit like the approach to GD5, uh, it was my view that uh, the hierarchy of uh, planning policy uh, opened the door to uh, an expectation of retail activity uh, as part of a vibrant and colourful district uh, at the waterfront as advocated by uh, GP3 of the South Western Helia framework, uh, which uh, expressly mentions uh, retail activities uh, to keep uh, life uh, all year round. Um, the position is... Um, set out in the uh, floor space schedule in relation to the objective of uh, primarily uh, local needs retail, which is identified as a, uh, a food store. There are other opportunities for um, modest provision. Uh, I think there are a total of five uh, opportunities identified, two of which are likely to be some kind of tourist kiosk um, function within the... Um, pavilions um, in the open space. The amount of retail is very modest, it's less than 1% of the gross floor space. Um, it is considered um, that it will um, align with the objective of delivering uh, local needs um, retail. Uh, it is considered through the uh, uh, retail impact assessment that the uh, spend to be generated by the population that emerges from the uh, new development uh, will uh, enable a, a viable um, convenience store. Uh, the objective is uh, to uh, not compete with St. Helio Town Centre and the conclusions uh, both early on in my submissions and in the, in the retail policy statement are that the town centre uh, trades well. Uh, there is a very low level of vacancy, particularly in comparison to uh, national averages. 
and there is a uh, strategic position that uh, supporting new developments within the centre of St Helier will, in the uh, in a spatial sense, add more residents who are themselves likely to uh, support the customer base for uh, the town centre. Uh, I think the conclusions of the um, technical submission align with the higher level conclusions which were in the um, submissions during the life of the, uh, the application, um, particularly uh, in relation to the um, delivery of local needs facilities uh, covered by the spend from the new population. It's also, I think, particularly relevant that uh, sequentially there are considered to be uh, no um, opportunities for a, uh, a comparable um, offer. And in the absence of the wider project, it is not likely that the retail floor space uh, would come forward uh, in isolation, hence uh, demonstrating it is tied to the delivery of uh, this uh, wider project. Okay. Do you want to? Yeah, I thought the um, retail impact assessment, we, we got it last Friday, I think I got it last Friday, it wasn't ideal, but um, I went through it and it seems to be a competent, well-evidenced document and we wouldn't dispute its findings. I think all we'd want to make sure is that uh, ultimately there are conditions attached that prevent um, you know, the retail units being uh, expanded or knocked through from one unit to two units to three units. Um, to make bigger and bigger units, which could then uh, create a different retail offer, where, which could impact on town. Uh, but as it stands, I, uh, I have no comment to make on the, uh, on the retail impact assessment. I think the proposal is compliant with policies ER1 and ER2. I think I would just add to that from a development control perspective, just to highlight that because it was received late, it hasn't been consulted on, so there is a St Helier Town Centre Manager who might be interested in, in having sight of that. Um, as with any retail impact assessment, it is based on a series of assumptions. We haven't tested those assumptions or reviewed it any further than having a cursory review of it. Um, I guess the point I would note is that it, one of the findings is that the proposed floor space, um, only 68% of the proposed retail floor space will be served by residents of the development. But the further 32% will then draw footfall from surrounding um, developments so that reveals that it's potentially going to become a destination um, but I don't want to labor the points I agree that the SPG requires some form of retail use to help to assist with vibrancy um, I just also note that there are permissions extant permissions for retail uses at ground floor level in Castle Quay and the Horizon development so it, it should just be concerned that um, there's a potential for this to become a destination and compete with the retail core of St Helier um, and that may not be the case but we haven't reviewed this um, in development control any further or, or had any further input from anybody in terms of retail impact. Okay, um, I just asked one question to the planning authority and one of Mr Nicholson. Question to the planning authority, um, is, is there any uh, report which um, well, what I'm used to in, in England is sort of like a health check report uh, of the town centre. I think there has been uh, reports done relatively recently. I think our economic units also keep figures of footfalls through town, uh, which do show a quite, quite a good uh, spring back from the pandemic era. Um, I, I don't have access to those reports at present, but I could probably get my hands on one. Okay. Well, my, my health check, for what it's worth, would be better than virtually <laughs> any town in England. Yeah, <laughs> um, but uh, I, uh, seriously, uh, my, my question to, to Mr Nicholson, I haven't, haven't read the, the, the Nexus report and perhaps listened to some of the comments from uh, Ms Johnson there, is, is about, um, uh, the, well, the application of the sequential test and uh, what this retail is, is intended for and link to some of the broader discussions we had about connectivity with um, the town centre and uh, bridging uh, the, the road. Um, and I mean, I, I just estimate that it's from, from the site, you've probably got about, I don't know, 400 metres or so to get to the 
the is it called the core retail area on the uh, on the on the proposals map? That isn't far, so you know it, it just uh, throws up the question in my mind: Do you really need a convenience store uh, on the site, and wouldn't the town centre benefit from the uh, population of this development uh, making that trip into the town to spend their money in in, in town and uh, add to the vibrancy and vitality of that town centre. Um, I I see your uh, I see your thought process. I uh, I took quite a while to adjust to uh, a kind of Jersey perception of, of distance. Um, that I, I think there was a. Um, uh, kind of relative test. The Jer Jersey is a small place, and I think people uh, tend to um, gravitate to uh, you know, their, their immediate environments. Um, you know, the the idea of driving a long way uh, to do anything is is alien in, in Jersey, and I think it's the same for walking. the The objectives of of the application are are to create a place where where people can live. It's part of a a, a new community. Uh, and um, we are responding to the uh, position set out in the uh, in the SPG uh, to uh, provide um, activity at ground floor, to provide uh, convenience, to uh, you know, support the delivery of a place where where people can live. I I, I don't think that it is an unreasonable expectation that. Um, you should have to walk uh, into the town centre to go and get a, a, a pint of milk. Um, okay. uh, the, the, uh, the, there will be a uh, series of people, as Mr Hyde explained this morning, uh, you know, coming and going throughout the day who work in the town centre, and that is part of supporting the, the broader activities. But this is supposed to be a, a kind of healthy, multifunctional um, all, all day into the evening, um, you know, thriving uh, place to, uh, to to enjoy, and uh, part of that is a very modest amount of retail space, uh, which will not impact on uh, the, the town centre, and uh, which will support the delivery of a, a new community. Okay, thank you. Anything? Yeah, I guess just. Um it, it is a concern, as you acknowledge that. Um that perhaps people won't make the trip into the um, core retail area. And I think it was kind of reinforced a little bit when I looked at the retail impact statement in paragraph 3.15. Um, it says that most comparison goods expenditure generated by the scheme will be directed to St. Helier's core retail area. However, the pro proposed convenience store will stock day-to-day -day household comparison goods. Other occupiers could sell day-to-day -day comparison goods, which are often purchased close to home such as beauty and medical goods, gifts and cards, stationary items, and so on. So it's just, um, there is a potential that people won't bother to make the trip into the core area, because why would they if it's all on their doorstep? And that's um, a potential that's, impact. Uh, that, that's, not a, um, uh, that, that's not a wild position. Um, and the, uh, the final uh, penultimate paragraph of, of the... Um, of the statement at 4.25, the last paragraph, has that kind of doomsday scenario. And it says, even if all the retail turnover of the application proposal was diverted from existing retailers in St. Helier Town Centre, the impact would equate to just over 1% of the, of the operator's turnover. In the context of all the other things that this application does, um, th that is not, um, in my view, uh, a, a demonstration that um, there is uh, unreasonable harm um, that's going to occur to the, the town centre, even in that doomsday scenario. Okay. Uh, in relation to, if I might just follow up, testing the assumptions that the, the position set out in the uh, first and second planning statements is entirely consistent with the um, uh, more technical uh, conclusions in the planning statement. Uh, our position has been consistent uh, throughout. Okay. Right, so just take a few questions on re retail provision in town centre. Mr Viber. Thank 
it. Uh, I have to say I'm surprised by what I've heard because there is a very clear policy adopted by the parish of St Helier, which is to discourage any commercial act retail activity outside of the town centre. And it's a laid down policy by the parish and it's supported by planning. Uh, not long ago, a, a planning application for a large operation up at Montalabe was refused very much on those grounds. So there is a policy in Jersey uh, and the town centre is certainly doing better than a lot of English towns, but it's still in trouble. And there are something like nine shops still vacant in St Helia, compared to the days when there were none whatsoever. So it's not an easy time, and I know this might only be a small amount of retail, but it sets a precedent that I think needs to be taken care of. Thank you, Mr. Barber. Okay. Right. Um, okay, well, I think we'll draw a line and uh, session eight. Shall we just take a um, short break and then... Uh, come back with the drainage. Ten minute break. Okay, yes, yep. thank you.
Okay, right. Uh, let's go on to drainage and flood risk. Uh, Mr Nicholson, you wanted to take these slightly out of order, so you wanted to do flood risk and coastal defence proposal first, is that correct? Yes, please. Um, well, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I wonder if Belter wouldn't mind um, linking up to the um, witnesses we've got on, on, uh, on screen. So, um, Helen. Uh, Helen Judd from uh, ACOM. Uh, thank you for your patience uh, waiting, Helen. Are we okay? Hi, Helen, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent, thank we you can. Very much. Of course, um, coastal defence flood risk is an integral part of the application, uh, supporting the uh, strategic policies of the Bridging Island Plan. Um, I think we have a large degree of uh, common ground on this. And if I could hand over to Helen to um, introduce it, of course, you have the written submissions as well, sir. Yeah, I don't know. What do you want me to go through? So, ACOM prepared a flood risk assessment to support um, the application, working closely with the coastal team in ACOM, who are um, developing the concept design of the defences and as well Gillespie's the drainage strategy. Um, we uh, submitted the application and we got comments back from the government of Jersey, which we've responded to. Um, and I've got confirmation from Andy Downey and Steve Fitzgibbon from the government of Jersey that I don't think there's any unresolved matters now. There was one when I submitted the statement of common ground, but Andy's now um, accepted that anything outstanding can be resolved as part of the construction environmental plan or as part of detailed design. Okay. Well, it, it would be helpful uh, because this is this is a public inquiry, and we we have members of the public here. Um, if you could explain in a few uh, sentences, in simple terms, what what the coastal defence is, what 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 is the actual proposal? Okay, John, would you be best to do that? Or yeah, sure, I can do. Um, should I introduce myself to the room? can cover the coastal defence elements and then Helen perhaps the flood risk side of things. Yeah. Hello all, I'm John Short from ACOM, so I led on the coastal defence design elements from our side. Uh, so working closely um, with the government of Jersey um, and through quite a lot of close engagement and collaboration with them and other key stakeholders, ACOM has undertaken the outline design of the new required coastal defences to support the development. Really this has been based on um, the requirements of the development but also uh, importantly to manage flood risk not only to the site but the areas adjacent and behind that are also potentially at risk uh, in the present day and will continue to be um, going forward. So we have undertaken the technical assessments and modelling, option appraisal, uh, and the engineering required to identify the um, preferred option and the geometry and nature and structure of the, uh, the defences and the crest height that's required to provide the one in 200 year standard uh, of protection to the development. So principally the risk that is being faced from the coastal side isn't one of extreme water levels, of still water levels, it's when there is a storm combining with high tides and it's through wave overtopping over the existing seawall that we currently see um, overtopping risk to the site. Obviously with climate change and sea level rise that is set to exacerbate going forward um, and the current defences are required to be raised uh, by approximately 1.2 metres above the existing wall height with the new defence uh, that's proposed to provide the standard of protection for the development but also delivers the shoreline management plan uh, policy requirements. Thank you. That's really, really helpful. Um, uh, <laughs> do you want to introduce yourselves? Sir? Yeah. Good afternoon. I'm Andy Downey. I'm principal engineer for Liquid Waste Infrastructure Department. Okay. I'm Steve Fitzgibbon. I'm the lead engineer for Coastal Engineering. Okay. 
Right. I, I mean, I've, I should say, I've, I've read the submissions, I've read the flood risk assessment, I've read uh, various documents that have been flying around. Um, I, I'm keen to understand if there's the extent of common ground or if there are any differences or if there are matters that require further detail to, to be worked on and how they would be um, captured in planning conditions. So could you just pick up from what, what you've heard from the, the applicants team and confirm or otherwise? Yeah, in terms of the... Yeah, sure. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. In terms of the coastal fences, um, yeah, we fully agree with what's been proposed in terms of um, the assessments that have been done. They're in line with the requirements of the shoreline management plan to look at protection um, from coastal events for the one in 200 year return period event. Um, it's in line with the shoreline management plan and the Prison Island plan policies. Um, so within that area, the policies are for advanced align or adaptive management. The scheme that's been proposed is a combination of both. So adaptive management where you have the scallop sections going round to um, advance the line, further round to the west. Um, in both locations, the idea is to raise the crest height sufficiently to have a uh, wave over topping reduction from present day levels um, to an acceptable level and also to include the requirements for um, future provisions for sea level rise and those provisions are looking forward um, to 2040, 2070 and 2120 including the sea level rise within those the modelling. Um, there is some residual overtopping that will still occur um, and at detailed design stage we have agreements that we will look at how the drainage provisions will address and um, deal with any residual overtopping. Okay, so there's there's really no difference be, be, between you and I'm picking up that in terms of the, the coastal defence, this is a very good thing. This is a, a, a very positive element of the proposal. I mean, would, would it need to be put in place even if this development weren't occurring? Yes, within the shoreline management plan, um, the coastal management unit, um, St. Hovens Bay, um, we do need to put in protection along the entire bay. Um, the West Park area, there's wave over topping, which then result in flooding through, um, this was seen in 2008, when the sea defences failed um, through some loss of the crest um, on the existing sea defences. That will only get worse with time and sea level rise. Um, so what we'd be looking to do aside of this project, uh, this scheme, would be to put a scheme in place to protect um, from wave overtopping that would result in flooding through to Gloucester Street um, and further into town towards Sand Street Car Park and those areas. So that is a scheme that we have to be looking at. Uh, yeah, I can remember the map in the flood risk assessment yeah. which identified those those areas. And could, could I ask the uh, ACOM representatives? Um, we, we've heard earlier in the week um, some concerns about um, uh, access to the beach and you know at the moment in the defense uh, you can actually uh, walk you know walk through and go down the the, the revetments which at one point they've got the, the little I won't say little but they are the lesser steps on, on them um, uh, will that still be the case with the defense in place would you still be able to gain that access down down to the beach yeah I, I can start with that one so I suppose another point to make as part of the general defence requirements and the defence um, standard protection improvements, we have also included for a relocation of the existing slipway and improvements to that liaising with um, the duck boat operators for the requirements for things like turning circles, mobility um, and uh, angles that they can utilise. Uh, as well as that, there will be uh, pedestrian um, access through that um, or down that um, proposed new slipway and certainly at detailed design other sort of beneficial measures in terms of access can certainly be 
um, looked at and where possible uh, included in the design if it's judged to be of benefit. Sorry, I, I, that, that last bit, I, I, I understand the new slipway proposal, but there was a point made earlier uh, in, in the week about um, um, the the gap that you can get through at the moment, which is kind of where, where, where it turns, if you if you know what I mean, in, in, in the corner. And it, it's a popular place because uh, people, uh, particularly in the evenings, seem to use the, uh, the, the defence as a sort of sitting out area and uh, it's a congregating place and they, they go through, through that gap. Uh, and somebody earlier in the week said, you don't want to have to go all the way down to the slipway to... Uh, to, to do that. So will, will that gap and the steps still uh, be maintained in the new design? I think, as, as I've mentioned, uh, from, from a coastal defence point of view, the current outline design is as proposed. I think uh, going forward, there will obviously be the need to um, review and validate and confirm any potential access or egress um, improvements and also public realm improvements, which is probably best covered um, by others rather than myself but um, hopefully that helps and opportunities to improve that through the slipway up, um, relocation will obviously be looked at as well okay so i think that's a no then to to my answer um that that gap of that stepped access would be close i, I mean i'm assuming from a defense viewpoint the less gaps you've got in it the better uh, yeah, obviously, we, yeah, we couldn't have a gap in the defence itself. However, yeah, if there is, yeah, I, I suppose there's the ability to relook at that in terms of how that could be accommodated uh, at detailed design. Uh, there are measures you can put in place, such as gates and the like, but obviously the more of those you have in place, the potential for residual risk increases. If I may, sir. Um, the, the present arrangement is that you go up a series of steps you do, yeah. um, and, and it's literally you're just it's a, a breach through almost a capping stone um, on that wall and then you go down a further series of steps before yes. you make it onto the scallops. Yeah. Um, there are a number of, of seawalls around the island where the alternative uh, means of accessing the beach is by, via steps um, and, and so we would the intention is, um, and I'm happy for this to be a, a commitment, um, that we would look to work with the authorities, with our designers, to achieve a stepped access um, that would, that I believe, would be possible without breaching the the sea defence yes. itself. Yes, it is, it, a, it is a bit lower than the some steps. It is a bit lower than the top down. of the wall, isn't it? As I recall, I think it's, uh, I've just found the, the street view image. It's the it's the capping stone, and then. Ten centimeters. So you base you more or less step up to the, the three, top of the yeah. It's three yeah. reasonably large steps. Yeah. 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 Probably. Well, I appreciate that yeah. there are disabled access issues that have going to be dealt with by, by the uh, slipway. But uh, uh, okay, that, that's fine. That's really helpful. Um, okay. I'll, well, I'll just go to uh, the gallery, Mr. Vibert. You yeah. ask a question. Quickly. Yep. Of course. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yes, the question of access to the beach is extremely important, and I wondered if you'd, the experts had looked at the way all the steps have been done all the way along St Oban's Bay. There's at least six steps from West Park to St Oban's that go down to the beach. They've been there for probably before the 1900s, I would have thought. And it's important, obviously, from a control point of view, from your point of view, of making sure that we don't have a sea problem. But is it not possible to do something like that? And is that not worth looking at? And also, we would need more than just one set. We would need at least three or four sets along that beach there. And would that affect the defences if you had to do that? Not sure who, who's best to cover that, whether that's um, in the room uh, or, or myself. In terms of the last part of that question, adding stepped access to the defence, 
I don't think would compromise the function of it or the ability for it to provide the standard of protection required. Um, it, it would just be a, a point of detail for the design uh, to include that. That's, that's probably the second part of that question I've answered. I don't know if the room wished to expand on potential sort of access or, or commitments around looking at steps as part of the proposal. Mr. Henry will pick that up. Um, so, so at the moment there are um, two um, entrance uh, steps um, onto the scallop seating. Um, I think we would commit to retaining those in, in, the, in the new form. So there would be two means of entry. Um, those, those entry points, I believe, coincide with, um, with steps that exist between those, the scallop seating. Um, so it would, it would make sense for, um, for, for, for those um, entrance points to be, um, to be maintained. Um, looking at the extension to the um, uh, to, to the, uh, the proposed extension to the coastline, um, there, there, there could well be an opportunity for a further um, stepped, stepped access point before you reach the, uh, the new slipway, and that's something that you know, we yeah. can look at at the detailed design stage, taking uh, Mr. Vibert's point around um, access, uh, easy access to the, to the, to the beach for, 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 for town residents and use visitors to the space. Okay. okay, so so any more on coast the coastal defence proposal? Um No sir, I think it's um it's been touched on uh, previously about its um it's need. Uh, it's very positive feedback from the um, planning authority. Uh, we have the strategic flood risk assessment, shoreline management plan. We have all the policies about uh, resilience within uh, the island plan, responding to climate change, and I um, appreciate the work that everyone's done to get us to this point. Yes, and uh, my massive paperwork, I've just found the uh, statement of common ground on the coastal defence. I knew I'd seen it somewhere, which has got a, a useful summary and conclusion. Um, just, just before Ms Judd goes, um, I just don't want to lose that issue of flood risk, because there's obviously coastal flood risk and there's uh, I say normal flood, flood risk. Um, um, the, the officers, it, could you just update me in terms of uh, inland flood risk? Um, where yeah. are, you? are you? Are you agreed? We are uh, agreed enough, I think, for us. Agreed to, enough. I like agreed that. enough for <laughs> anything that's outstanding with regard to inland flood risk. We can um, agree at the detailed design stage. It's very, very minor. Yes, because I, I think I read in your submissions that... Um, Uh, there were, what was I saying? Yeah, there, there, there was a bit more work uh, required for the scrutiny and approval, but you're comfortable that that can be dealt with uh, yes. conditions and That's, As I say, it's, uh, so it was, um, it's very, very detailed, maybe a matter of interpretation as well between myself and Helen. But ACOM have, have followed the SLFR, the flood risk assessment a process that's identified in the BIP um, to the letter. So we can't, I um, uh, don't believe we have grounds to challenge that. Uh, the same, uh, if I may move on to the drainage aspects of it. Yes, well, yep. th those are the other matters we need to pick up. So, um, what, uh, do you mean surface water or foul or both? Both. Both, okay. Yeah, so, similar processes have been followed with the drainage impact assessment, which is for foul sewage impact, and surface water impact, which is a flood impact assessment. Uh, so, we've, there's been several iterations of reports and modelling that's been done on our computer model by independent consultants. So we've reached an, er an area of common ground that we're happy with. There's a few minor um, details that we're happy to uh, resolve at detail design stage. Okay, and, and that's captured in that statement that uh, I think I was given this morning. It's the, yeah. the one pager. That statement that's supported with the current versions of the drainage impact and flood impact assessments. 
Okay, because in in my notes when I was doing my prep on this, there, there was there was an issue around the Weybridge um, CSO, whatever that stands for. The combined sewer overflow. So, uh, um, as if a bit of background, the majority of town is on a combined sewer network, so it has foul and surface water. So, in, during times of heavy storm, um, we get spills of com uh, dilute sewage to sea. It happens. Um, so, this site is downstream of that combined sewer overflow. We've seven or eight CSOs throughout the island, but they, happy, they, they operate fairly regularly. There was an impact at this CSO as a result of this development, backing up the flows um, to the CSO, but we've uh, modified the way that the flows come into the system. We've uh, reviewed the occupancy figures um, for the whole of the development, so we're happy that we're you're, now... You're um, content. Uh, it's a negligible impact going forward. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. That's, uh, that's straightforward. Um, I don't think there's any questions on foul and surface drainage, so excellent. We've finished uh, sooner than I thought. So, um, well, th thank you all for those contributions in, in the room and, uh, uh, and online. Um, that brings to an end in session nine. We're going to break uh, at this point. Uh, some of us, I, I don't think it, <laughs> not everybody needs to attend this, this evening, but uh, could I just um, actually understand who will be here this evening? Um, yes, sir. Right, OK. Uh, as far as I know, we've got three speakers. Well, we've got um, the Jersey Youth Parliament, and I think they, there is a number of those, three of them, three of them and uh, some adults that are, that are coming with them. Uh, they, I've put them on first. They'll, they'll speak first, and then who are the others? Are we? Jane Blakely. Jane Blakely, right? And I don't know if Mr. Mason wants to speak. Mason, you've spoken loads, sir. <laughs> but uh, you're you're very welcome if you if you do want to come along. Okay. Well, um, so I may see, well, we'll see some of you later, and if you're coming back tomorrow, I will see you again then. So thank you all.